You're listening to the Hawk Media Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping entrepreneurs and executives crush the digital marketing game. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's get into the show. All right, you're listening to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Jordan Wynn and Sharon Pack. How are you guys? Good. Thanks so much for having us. Big fan. I was just listening to one of the episodes this morning, so cool to be on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. All right, so going to start with both of you, but I, I think I'll start with Jordan. But, you know, got to imagine you, like, came out of the womb and then, like, started telling people how to do their hair or helping them with their makeup. Like, how did it all start? Let's take it back to where are you from? Let's start with that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm originally from a really small town in Wyoming. Um, you'll actually hear Sharon and I, like, have some, like, funky correlations to, to our stories. But um, I'm from a really, really small town in Wyoming, like, population 200. There's, like, five buildings downtown not there's not a grocery store like three hours from the airport very small um and then when my parents got divorced my mom moved to a slightly larger town but still very small in montana so very much from like the country grew up riding horses and And when you moved um i moved i think my freshman year of high school okay and so growing up just real curious like you're in this small town what was like beauty or fashion or any, did you have an attraction to that at that point or were you? No, I actually didn't wear, I mean, in, in that town, like, like there's not really like trends aren't really happening as much. Um, like I didn't even know like Louis Vuitton, I didn't know the Kardashians, like any of those things until I moved to California much, (laughs) much later. Um, so I don't think that I was necessarily super into beauty, but I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Like I started a, I always did lemonade stands. I started like a dog walking business. I had like a whole business plan, like drawn up for it. Um, and I had basically like a business pretty much like all through college, even I had like a couple different businesses in college. And so not necessarily, I did get into like hair, probably like middle school, high school. I was really into like French braiding and I would do like all my teammates hair and everybody at school. Um, but it was mostly like braids. Two questions. First teammates on what sport? Curious. Uh, volleyball. Nice. And uh, where do you think that came from the entrepreneurship side? Like were your parents entrepreneurs? Was your mom push? Did she push that? Yeah. Both of my parents were, uh, like hardcore entrepreneurs. My dad has like a construction company that he owns. And my mom is like the most ultimate entrepreneur I've, I think I've ever met. Um, we started off like very low income family and, uh, my mom would like start a bunch of random businesses and we would like the whole family would work them. She had like a wood, like essence brand where we literally were like chopping wood, dipping it in oil, and then like selling it at, um, like little vendor fairs. And then when we were in high school, she had like a really bad experience with a local ship, like shipping center. And she was like, I'm just going to start my own. And we were like, of course you are. And then literally boxes started like arriving at our house and she was not joking. And so in high school, me and my sister um, for like our second job, we actually worked at my mom's box shop. That's what it was called. And we did like shipping and gifts. Um, And then even after we graduated. Um, my little brother was the youngest behind us and my mom had never went to college. And so she actually went to college the same year as my little brother to the same college and then, um, got her undergrad and then went on to get her law degree. And now she has her own law firm and she was like the oldest in her class, but she's been, yeah, she's like the ultimate entrepreneur. You can do whatever you want to do. Like very confident. And I think that she really instilled that in me where just like no fear, like, let's give it a go. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's really amazing. So had kids that have graduated high school, goes back to law school and starts her own law firm. I mean, I guess, yeah, she was before Kim Kardashian going back to that. <laughs> exactly. She was the original Kim Kardashian. <laughs> there it is. And so Sharon, curious with you, uh, taking it way back, uh, did you come out immediately and know that you wanted to get into hair and beauty and that side of the business or where, where did it all start? Not. It's so funny because Jordan and I have very, very similar backgrounds. Um, I'm from a really small town in Arizona. It's a border town called Rio Rico. Um, My parents are South Korean immigrants. They moved here after they got married. They really came for the American dream. And once they landed in LA, they realized, wow, it's actually really hard to survive in the US as an immigrant. My mom worked in like a sweatshop and my dad was a truck driver. Um, So when they heard through the grapevine that there was um, opportunity in this small border town population of like a couple hundred, like I remember my my entire school had maybe like 200 people in the entire school. Um, and you knew everyone because it was such a small school. Um, 
they moved down to Arizona, which was called Rio Rico. And my dad was a truck driver. He would take um, merchandise from this small border town called Nogales to California and then drive it back and forth, back and forth. Um, My dad actually passed away when I was 13. Um, He had a, it was like a fluke. He had a random heart attack. Um, So then my mom who speaks zero English had to kind of step in and just take over. Um, I have I have an older sister and a younger brother, um, all similar in age gap to Jordan's family as well to another fluky coincidence. Um, but my mom is the one who really encouraged me to do what I'm doing right now. Um, as an Asian American, usually you're encouraged to take a very stable route, right? They want you to be a doctor, a lawyer, something that brings very steady income. Like taking a risk is not something that is ingrained in us. And in the beginning, I actually had a huge fight with my mom about this because I initially went to school for pre-med. But then after taking a couple of chemistry classes, I was like, this is not for me. I'm not going to keep trying to make this work. So I, I took two classes and then dropped it immediately. So this is where actually where Jordan and I met, we both went to Pepperdine. Um, Yeah. And we were in the same uh, capstone classes. That's how we actually cross paths in we can get there in a second. But um, when I originally wanted to kind of go down this path, my mom was super against it because it was so risky. And there's like, not as an immigrant, it's really hard to um, take that big of a risk. So yeah, that's kind of my life story. And so growing up, I'm curious with you, were you entrepreneurial as well? Did you like did you jump into helping with bills or anything like that or working? You No interest. So you, as you said, you want to go. Absolutely not. I was, it's so funny because I think I built my confidence much later in my career. I didn't, I was the quiet one. I never really spoke up. Even when I was, you know, Jordan and I met at ColourPop, if some, if they posed a question, I never directly voiced my opinion. I would whisper to Jordan and Jordan would be like, Sharon thinks that da, 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 da. And it's because I was, I never realized that I could have, a say or a, or a stand on what I was doing. And it's something that I learned over the years. And, and so going to where you just left off. So you guys, you met senior year, you said your capstone. So I assume senior year at Pepperdine. Well, Jordan thinks it's their senior year, but I remember her in my (laughs) freshman year, she joined second semester and we were both again, fluke in the same dorm. There's like 30 dorm rooms or dorm, like dorm, like residences um, on the campus. And we both ended up at the not dorm. She was on the third floor. I was on the first floor. She doesn't remember me, but I do remember her. Um, and we were in the same um, major, which is the integrated marketing communications. And then wow. in our capstone year is when we really started working with each other, kind of rubbing shoulders and um, getting to know each other on a deeper level. And so you, you're getting to that point. So you, when did you switch from pre-med, by the way? I switched in my sophomore year. Okay, cool. And so you've had a couple of years of that. At that point, was it for both of you, just let, let, get out, get a marketing job? Was that the dream at the time? Like you wanted to get into integrated marketing. You wanted to find either an agency or a brand to work for. Like, where were you thinking your path was at this point? On my end, I think I had no idea. I moved to California from Montana. Like I, I think when you're in these really small towns, like you don't even understand what all the career opportunities are. Like a lot of people become teachers. Like that's like what most of the people from my class were because you don't understand like all the different like levels in, in like corporate America, I guess. So I just really went to school for something that I thought was interesting. And the courses, I picked my major like purely based on courses. I didn't even know that I would go into marketing. I think it was like really crazy. I had really no intention of even getting into the beauty space, but I really needed money. And so I had like a couple side businesses. I had like a nanny business. Um, I was selling like cheese boards. And then uh, I actually got like approached by one of the families that I nannied for. And they were like, oh, we're starting like a something. They didn't even tell me that it was a cosmetic brand. And they wanted somebody like younger who was still in college, who like really understood like the millennial audience. And so, um, and I was like, oh, I can't do it because I like need the money from my nanny job. And they were like, oh, well, we'll at least match that. So that was the only reason that I took it. So I think I was just like hustling any opportunity, but I didn't even have like a big vision of what I would do. I just knew eventually I wanted to have my own brand. You did. You, you knew that at some point. And did you know what category you wanted that to be in? 
No, at first I wanted to have a nonprofit and that's still something that I would love to have at some point. I like love animals and animal rescue. And um, I think that there's like so much opportunity in nonprofit, particularly on the animal side that really pairs with like the kind of social media marketing that I've learned. Um, But I didn't, I didn't know that I would do like a D to C brand for sure. Especially at that point in time, like D to C was not really around. And so it wasn't so easy to like envision being an entrepreneur. It was more like, more like a services entrepreneur, which is something that I'd seen my mom do when I was younger. Makes sense. And how about you, Sharon, when you switched, were you like, I want to go into marketing, like I want to get a marketing job or was it, I'm going to build something? I originally wanted to get a marketing job and I started interning a ton. Like every summer I was doing two interns in Korea, in the U S just like anything that I can get. I wanted to get as much. Are you actually going back to Korea a lot? Yeah. I used to go in the summer because I have family there. Um, and I was interning at advertising agencies. I worked actually, I interned at Shia Day, which is like one of the biggest advertising agencies in the world. And I actually learned, I didn't like working with multiple clients. I liked having one thing that I could focus on and really pour myself into. And that's kind of how I narrowed down to like, oh, okay. Like I I definitely want to be in-house. Like social media marketing is really interesting to me. Influencer marketing is interesting to me. Um, And that's kind of how I like weeded it out. But I didn't have an entrepreneurial spirit until I got to ColourPop. That's really where I learned how to voice myself and really um, kind of decide that I liked having my own thing to grow. Which is a huge compliment to the founders there because that's huge. Um, That's amazing to create. So did you go right there after school? We, it was kind of interesting because Jordan was interning at ColourPop at the time um, because she, it was, it was again, all by coincidence, she was nannying for a family and they're like, Hey, somebody that I know is looking for an intern. You should do it. And at the time, ColourPop didn't even exist. It was just a concept. Um, she was interning there. And then in our, in my senior, in our senior year, she was basically recruiting people for the business because at that time ColourPop was about to launch. And for me, um, I didn't want to go back to Arizona and I didn't have a job set locked yet. So I was like, you know what? I'll just take whatever I get. So I go into this interview, get the job. And that turns out to be ColourPop. Um, we both were there from the start, um, really helped the business go from zero to the 8 million followers that it currently has right now. Um, and we got to really learn how to incubate brands. That's honestly where I fell in love with, with building brands was in that environment because that's when ColourPop turned into Seed Beauty, which they have Kylie Cosmetics, KKW Beauty, Tati, and like Fourth Ray and Soul. Um, so we got to really experience building brands from the ground up over and over again. It was a great practice. Yeah, oh, amazing. And so how long were you guys there for? We were there for seven years. Seven years? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was our first yeah. job in really seven years. Like, oh. It's a long time to be at a brand. And were there points where you thought you're never going to leave or were you always like, I'm still, I'm going to put this to Jordan first. Were you always like, I I still need to go do my own thing at some point. Um, I think at the beginning I was like so obsessed, like Sharon and I, like we like eat, breathed and sleeped it. I don't know if that's the right connotation for that, but, um, we, we were like obsessed. We were working on it basically until we fell asleep. And then like at 5.00 AM and, um, So I think it like for a time period, it was so fulfilling that I had like no interest in leaving. I really felt like it was like my baby. But then um, at like at some point, I think you can kind of see that there are definitely different like career paths. And there are some people who become experts in like one field of marketing and then in in one field and then maybe say it is marketing and you want to go on to be like a CMO and like then your whole career is just like optimizing these funnels, which there's a ton to do. But I think that, um, eventually Sharon and I realized that like a part of our, some of our favorite part was like the building, like across the board and building like a community and building like a brand and to just stay in one funnel. And, and obviously as if you're a team member on a brand as a brand scales, like your role gets more and more narrow. And so I think Sharon and I were kind of experiencing that where at the beginning we're doing everything. And then over the years, you know, we're like kind of getting focused in while, while other like experts are being brought on. And so at that point, I think I was like, okay, like I, I loved like how it was. And I love like the hustle of a startup. And so then I think that's when Sharon and I, we also knew we worked really well together. One, one of my favorite parts of like the Sharon and I origins, story, which a lot of people call us 
shorten because um, we were like the faces of ColourPop together all the time. And so we like got this nickname and, and everybody called us that. Um, but the kind of the origin of that was Sharon and I were in those classes together, but we both were working like a ton and we didn't really have like the same kind of social life that maybe a lot of other college students did. So when it would come to group projects, nobody would pick us because we didn't know anyone. Um, and so we would always end up being like buddies by like default because we were the only ones left. And we actually worked really, really well together. And when I was helping um, recruit for like ColourPop before their launch, I tried to get a bunch of my friends to start and none of them wanted to like go join a startup. And so my mom was like, oh, you should actually pick somebody who you've worked really well with, like not a friend. Why would you pick a friend for that role? And so Sharon, obviously we'd done a bunch of group projects and we both like crushed it. Like it was never an instance where you're in a group and like one person's doing everything. Um, and so I told her about it and then she kind of told the story of where she started, but it worked out really well because now Sharon and I have been together for like what like almost 11 years working together and so it was really great advice that's awesome and so i'm curious sharon on your end will you go to join a beauty startup your mom who wanted you to be pre-med how did that go over was that at that point that she accepted your change in career was it pretty open or she was so upset we didn't talk for two months actually because really? i had direct to... yeah i broke up a little bit I think, yeah, you're glitching, Sharon. I thought maybe it was me, but. Yeah. Oh. I saw you move and it was smooth, so I think it's Sharon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're back, Sharon. Oh, back. Is it working now? Oh, okay. Um, what I was saying is, oh, I got like an internet connection unstable note. Yeah, I think you're right now. Oh, yeah, I think you're not. back. Define? Oh. Maybe not. Maybe shut off your video, actually, because you're. Is it back? Oh, yeah, I think oh. you're back. Is it working now? I think nope. you're good. Okay. Um, I actually got into a huge fight with my mom and we didn't talk for two months because she was so disappointed. And she, she said this one line, she was like, don't call me when you're poor and you need money is what she said. And I was like, don't worry about it. I won't be calling you. And then, um, I kind of just went for it headstrong and just ignored, um, I think she kind of had to say about it. Uh, but after, but at the time also to remember DDC was not a thing, especially right. like Ecom businesses were not a thing. Nobody was doing that. Social media was just starting. Influencer marketing was just starting. Um, so I think it was really hard for somebody so traditional to wrap their head around this concept. Um, so that's kind of how it happened. But now I always tell her, I'm like, mom, remember that one time you told me not to call you when I was poor? I was like, I remember, <laughs> remember that. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And so I'm curious since, at what point, and we'll get obviously into the rest of the story, was there a point where she went, okay, okay? Oh, he, major. I think, again, like Jordan said, we were so obsessed. We were so obsessed with building ColourPop. We had no personal life. Um, we were, and on top of that, ColourPop is in Oxnard. So we were living not, so right. we weren't in the city. We were both in either Oxnard, like Santa Barbara area or Calabasas area, which is super far from basically everything. Yeah. Um, so I think when she saw grit and just passion that we had for the for the brand is when she realized okay this is real and to see the progression of the brand in such a short period I mean in year two Colourpop was already just this beast everyone on the yeah. everyone was talking about it like it was like big, a household name by year two yeah, Which yeah is, it was crazy and you two drove a lot of that you were managing on the marketing right yeah we yeah. led the marketing teams there you go um and so I guess it well, I won't ask that question. I was going to say, at what point did you start looking? But you did seven years in, you get to that point where you're both feel like you, you know, it's at its course. Did you immediately know you were going to work together on the next thing or were you not sure yet? We had always talked about like how we want to do something together because actually at the, so when Sharon and I first started working together at ColourPop, like it, at the very, very beginning, of course, it was like good because it's like low table stakes. But then as everything started to really like grow, 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 and obviously Sharon and I were fortunate enough to be at the forefront of that, we actually got very competitive with one another. And we'd never had like a, a serious job before. And so even like some of those communication skills, like you're not, and, and we didn't have like a direct leader because it was so, we, we just reported directly to the founder. And so it was kind of like, you could take whatever you could get your arms around. And that really made like for this very competitive environment. Um, and so at the beginning, Sharon and I were like duking it out all the time. And 
it got to the point where we literally had to sit down and be like, okay, we like hate working with each other and like, but neither of us are going to leave. So we better fix this. And then we did. And and we had a couple of those moments that we really worked through together. And so after like a couple years of that, we really realized like we do have very different strengths. Like there's no reason for us to like compete with one another, even internally at ColourPop, they called us shorten because they didn't know who did what. So they would just be like, oh, shorten, can you? And it, then it would be like open-ended of like, who's going to take it. And so we ended up being like, okay, like, this is what I like and what I'm good at. This is what you like and what you're good at. And so we would like naturally divide and conquer. And that's when we kind of realized like we have very complementary skill sets and we like make a perfect pair. And so that's when we wanted to go on and do something um, together. And we were, we had like a, like a notepad that we were always like writing down ideas on. And we had a bunch of like different crazy ideas. And at one point I was like, oh, maybe hair and Sharon, all, I would always like have these ideas and Sharon would kind of be like the temp check. And usually she's like, that's a terrible idea because of like X, Y, Z. And so when I said the hair idea, she's like, okay, that one, like that one's a good idea. And so, um, and very serendipitously, like within a couple weeks of us kind of agreeing that this was like a good, like a potential good brand. Um, Kevin, our now co-founder at Insert Name Here, which we haven't talked about, but which is our brand, <laughs> um, he DM'd yeah. us and we had met him through BeautyCon um, several years ago. And he was like, he kept asking us to dinner. And we were like, is he asking you to dinner? Like, cause he's in our DMs and we're like, so weird. And then he, like, we weren't answering him. And then he like group DM'd us and he's like, will you please let me take you to dinner? And we were like, oh, okay. So we went to dinner. We weren't sure if he was asking you on a date or yeah. Yeah, we were like, is he, we totally <laughs> thought he was hitting on us. We were like, did he message you? <laughs> and and knowing awesome. Kevin, he's the most innocent guy. So it's like, I get it. Like, just yeah. for the audience, like Kevin's such a straightforward guy. That That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's Kevin's just so scrappy that he was just like, like, yeah. let's like chat. And yeah. um, so then eventually we went to dinner with him and he was like, I know you guys did a color pop. Like, if you could do anything, what would it be? And we had literally just like agreed on this idea like two weeks before. Wow, got it. And so did Kevin go great I've got the money let's go like what what, what I'm curious what happened from there <laughs> basically so this was the I think this is what kind of really sold us into Kevin as a partner was we told him this idea Jordan was freaking out afterwards she was like I she was like I messed up I shouldn't have told us told him our idea he's gonna take it now and like run with it she was freaking out and I was like dude, I think it's fine. I don't think Kevin's going to go make a hair brand by himself, but <laughs> Kevin breaks off. He does this super extensive full on research into the hair space comes back overnight. With, what, yeah, overnight comes back with a report of like, what's the opportunity? What can we do here? How can we win? Just like all these things laid out. And we were like, wow, this guy is serious and he's obviously smart. Um, so that's what really made us, um, want to even explore this with mm -hmm. him. And so how quickly did you, like, tell me what happened next, but how quickly did you jump in and go, all right, Color Pop, it's been fun. We're out. This meeting was in July and we launched the brand in November. Wow. Like full on, <laughs> full yeah, built website, yeah. product, like Kevin and I went to Asia together, met the factory, like this all happened in a span of like four, four or five months. Well, just to be clear, because I'm pretty confident in this, you didn't raise any money either, right? You didn't go and get any, yeah, no venture money. Just for podcast too. So you're both shaking your head. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. No, we did not raise any money and we still haven't raised any money. We're still um, like fully self-funded. Yeah, and which is, again, I when you can do that, I think it's such a great way to build a business. And so from July to November, how quickly did you go full-time? Did you keep your job at ColorPop while you worked on the side or did you just bail and go? Yeah. I came over, Sharon came over like almost right away. Um, when did you come over in like February, Sharon? Yeah, in February, uh, but uh, no, actually in November, because I basically yeah. took a bunch of like consulting gigs to like bridge it for me, basically. Got it. Yeah. And then I came over in um, March, like the, like March, April of the next year. Got it. So Kevin was Kevin full time and you two were helping on the side while still helping a color pop until you had enough income to make it make sense. Is that real? Which, by the way, I say that and I highlight that because I think it's such an underrated way to start a business is to like, it's okay to keep your safety net until it actually makes sense to jump in full time. People are like, no, you have to throw everything into it. And it's like, actually you don't, it still means, by the way, getting used to having a full-time job and starting a company 
I think is the best prep for running a company because then Absolutely. you have to be able to handle that. So that's great. I, I, I think, think we were so both good. so young and so scared. It was a huge risk that we were taking. It's okay. not like we had all this money saved up and we were like ready to like go for it. It yeah. was a huge risk that we took. And it was a lot of time that we were dedicating outside of our work hours. Like we would finish work and then drive down to Santa Monica and do these like six hour meetings after work and end up like sleeping at one or two the next day. Like it was, it was like a huge undertaking. Like now that I look back on it, I'm like, how the heck did we do it? But were you um, with Oxnard at that time? I was, Jordan was, was yeah. So by the way, really fun little side note. So I grew up in a small town. My graduating class was 11. I then went to school in Arizona. So in, in Tucson. And then my dad's whole business was based out of Oxnard and I grew up in Ojai. So we oh know that was, that's <laughs> crazy. I was an hour away from Tucson. Yeah, no, I know. I know where you are. And then you were saying your dad with Nogales back and forth that way. It's like, yeah, I ended up in Nogales quite a few times. Um, wow. Yeah. Small world. Um, but yeah, in Oxnard too, my dad's headquarters was off Del Norte and he built a lot of that business. Oh. Part. Yeah. We're like right by the, right by Del Norte. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but that's actually, that's a funny, a lot of coincidences there. Yeah, so. exactly. But um, all right, so you you get this, so right away, you launch in November, you put the work in, you get help, got it up with Kevin. Did it go right away? Was it like, you already knew what you were doing there. So o- overnight you sold out, you're good. No, didn't happen that way. Absolutely <laughs> not. But that's what we expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were so good. sad. Yeah, we literally launch like we get ready to launch. We all go out um, like to a, like dinner, like a fancy dinner. We're like waiting for the first order. We like push the go live. Literally one of like our COO, Lucas, who's been with us since day one, um, he, his mom places an order and that's it. And then we were like, all right, like, it's okay. It's okay. We were like, kind of yep. like talk ourselves through it. And then basically over the next week, we we're getting like one order a day, like even longer than that. Like I can't even, we should have like documented, I guess we could look back now, but like yep. it took, everybody's like, oh, well, like it was easy for you. You guys just like popped off. And we were like, no, like it took, it took us like more, probably like four to six months before we had really any traction and even could figure out like the, the skew that we thought was going to be the best skew um, that like our original whole business model was around was like, we couldn't even sell it. It was like, we, we just sold out of the last pieces, like at the beginning of this year. Um, and then the skew that really took off was actually what like, year did you launch? how long has it been? We soft launched in, um, November of 2018 and like officially launched in, uh, March of 2019. Okay. So still it's been two and a half years and you just sold out of a, the first SKU that you thought was going to be your top seller. We yeah. thought we were going to be a wig company. Yeah. yeah. We thought our main product was going to be wigs, but that did not happen that way. <laughs> no. And so again, let's say two months in you, so you went in right away at November, you were saying Sharon, right there, you were actually consulting to keep the bills. Any uh, anxiety around that a month or two in when you're selling oh one gosh, a day? Yeah. yeah. Hundred percent, and I think a big part of it was the like, ColourPop was such a big part of who I was. It was like it ident like I identified identified myself through ColourPop. So when I left, it was kind of like a mental like f for me, I guess, where I was just like, wow, I lost this big part of who I am. So I was working through those like emotions while I was also trying to figure out like, can this even work? I don't know. I just took this big risk. <laughs> Yeah, because we we grew like a really big social following, like being known as the color pop girls. Like I was just moving and I was cleaning out my um, like closet and we like people were making us like custom like jackets and things that said like the color pop girls like short and like we we were really like born in in that space. And so for both of us, that was a really like tough and honestly like borderline dark period because um, it caused a lot of conflict because I was, of course, supposed to come over when like Sharon came over and I was literally too scared. And I think that, and, and there was like all this tension because Sharon like made the jump and I wasn't ready to make the jump. And like you said, like, and I think we also felt the pressure definitely like initially about like, oh, you just like give it your all. And I think like in hindsight, both of us have been like, oh, we definitely should have just like kept a, a job. Like, cause it's slow going at the beginning. You have no idea what to expect. It's literally changing like daily. And so I definitely would recommend to anybody starting a business to like stay where you are until you at least like prove that there's even something there. And I think that that's something we learned, but it caused like a lot of tension at the beginning. And so on that note of you not sure, and you said you joined in March, was that right? Yeah. So though once March hit, did you see traction? What what caused you to feel confident that you could make the leap? Or was it just like, all right, I've given this enough time, I've got to do it now? 
we had seen like a pretty good amount of traction. Like we were doing, I think we were doing like over a hundred K a month at that point in time, which oh. was kind of like a, a number that I had given uh, myself. And also like, it was just like, like I felt so guilty not coming over that it was like the the pairing of the two like okay like obviously there's traction like I can't really like I just I still was really scared but I had to make the leap and then even just like as on a friend level with Sharon she was like I need you to come over here and I was like okay yeah (laughs) also like yeah like Jordan said like we had built kind of a following during our years at color pop so we hadn't been able to talk about our involvement in the brand until much later and that obviously was a big boost because then everyone was like oh my gosh the shorten created this brand like oh i it's some now somewhat credible because when this hair brand comes out of the blue everyone's like where did it come from like why are all these people randomly talking about it all of a sudden like it just it 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 resonated in in a different way when we were able to like openly talk about it do you think there was a benefit though to build that base and that come before? Like, cause you could have done it day one and just, you've seen brands launch like this where it's like day one, they start talking about it, they get that boost, but they don't even have the systems built to nurture it. Like, do you think it was good that you had to start a little scrappy first before leveraging that? A hundred percent. Because I think that's when we realized like, wow, this brand has legs without us, like without our name. Yep. The, there was already traction before I even told people about it. People were interested. They were like, huh, what is this brand? Like what's going on? Obviously like us coming forward about it was kind of like a level, it was just like extra credibility, yeah. um, but the brand had legs without us. And was that in March when you did that? Yes, yeah. March. Got it. Awesome. And, uh, and, but you still, you got, so you got to hundred K a month in revenue before you announced it as your own business. That's in, in, in five months with yeah. no funding. So yeah. for anyone out there that's like, I need to raise money to get my business going, like million dollar plus business in five months with no funding and not leveraging any of your strategic advantages, frankly, at the beginning in terms of your audience and your own side of things. So yeah. that's awesome. We also, we also weren't doing any paid ads at that time, like no Facebook, no Instagram. Like it was all like fairly like organic. And when I say organic, I'm like doing air quotations. So I keep forgetting we're on a podcast, um, but it was like, yeah, we'll get both. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Um, it was like influencer gifting and social media, like just organic social media, then like word of mouth, I guess, but we weren't doing any like paid ads yet and that's also a testament to the product you you mean you found a hole in the market as you you know with you two coming up with the original idea and kevin's research it seems like then again you you thought you were going to so talk about the wig thing so you thought you were going to be wigs and how quickly did you realize you needed to change the product or focused on different products we really didn't know and so when we initially launched we launched with five wig styles and one clip and ponytail and in a matter of months we realized that one clip and ponytail was really resonating with the masses. And I think it also is due to Miss Ariana Grande, who was at this point popping off. Everyone was talking about her. Everyone wanted to be her. And she's iconic for her clip and ponytail, right? She has this really long hair piece. She's always strutting. Um, so that's the one product that really popped off for us. And that's when we realized, okay, like maybe a wig is a little bit unapproachable because it's covering your entire head. Like this clip and ponytail concept is, is a bit more palatable for people just because it's half of your head. Right. So that's when we really decided to dig deep into the clip and ponytail space, which now we're known as a clip and ponytail brand. We have like over 15 different styles and textures and lengths. Um, and it's been, what's really crafted and molded our product roadmap. Got it. And on the name, insert name here, got to hear the story. How did that come up? Uh, this took us a long time to develop. We almost like, we couldn't find a name that we loved and we almost were just like, whatever, like, we'll just like, who cares what the name is? We'll just have to like nail it in the branding. Um, so we were with, like Sharon said, we were like driving these late nights to Santa Monica and we were like all sitting together in the Shangri-La lobby. That was like one of our office spaces. Um, (laughs) we were just like sitting in there, like trying to think of what to name it. And we had some crazy names. Like one of them that also Lucas, our CEO, um, had come up with was, um, Wigarella. And we were like this close to just being like, fine, we'll be Wigarella, which good thing we didn't go that direction. Um, but then after one of those really late nights, it was like 2 a.m. And I literally like laid in bed and we had told ourselves if we couldn't think of it, like by the next day, we just had to pick one of the ones we had brainstormed that we didn't love. And I was literally laying in bed 2 a.m. And it like came to me. I was like, oh, you could be whoever you want to be, like insert name here. And we had already talked about naming all of our products, like after like giving them like names. And we referenced them as like she and um, 
they're all supposed to like the whole original idea was a lot about like transformation. And so um, that's kind of the aspect behind the name is like, it's all about self-expression. It's all about confidence, like living your own reality. Like you can be whoever you want to be. And we have names like Molly, um, like Kim, um, like Ariana. We had a ponytail named Ariana. Um, but that's kind of the direction. Got it. That's fun. And so now we're two and a half years into this. Uh, was it once you started getting going, you got to a million dollar run rate, you joined, you did this announcement. Has it just been all easy going since then and just kept growing? <laughs> Let's talk about like the scaling side of it. So you you get a few months later, like tell me about how it's been to actually you get a year later and COVID hits. Like how has that been? How, how was that sort of your year in, you made this commitment? I guess, let's start with one question. Have you both felt good about the leave since you left, like diving in as an entrepreneur? Has there been any doubt there? Or did you, once you committed, you felt good about it since? For me, like once I committed, I felt really good about it just because I was learning so much. And it's interesting because in the beginning, you're like, oh, I could be an entrepreneur, right? But once you actually are in the shoes of an entrepreneur, like it is a roller coaster up and down. You learn so much about yourself. There's so much personal growth that's happening. And also like, I never even knew what a PL was before I started yep. being a founder. Right. So I think from a growth standpoint, it's been incredible. Um, but I will say like 2020 was kind of like an unusual year for many brands because of COVID, like a lot of like big players had to pull out of like the performance marketing space. Right. So like yep. CPMs are super, super cheap. Like everyone could kind of pay to play. Like it was just yeah. like an easier time to enter the market. And we had a great 2020, like amazing. Yeah. We built our hot tool category during that period. We launched our first uh, hair waiver. Um, and I think it was April completely blasted wow. off, like on the day of launch. And after that, we couldn't get enough inventory in to even like support the sales. Like it was a very interesting time, but I think with 2021, like with the iOS updates, it's been like slightly different, um, but it's also like a different, it, you'd learn different things. So I wouldn't, I would, I don't regret it at all. How about you, Jordan? Do you ever have any, what, I wouldn't say regrets, but any like fear, like maybe I should have stayed in the job. Cause I know like, that's the thing that every entrepreneur could say is it's a roller coaster and it doesn't end. Like I, tr we thankfully my business partner and I realized this a while ago, but like Mark Zuckerberg is the richest guy in California and he's dealing with renaming his company. The government might shut him down, like all this crazy stuff. Like there's no finish line as an entrepreneur. The bigger you get, the more the problems are. So I was, I'm curious, have you had those moments where you're like, yeah, I don't know. Or has it just been once you got in, you're like, no, this is great. I think once I got in, I was like really committed to it. And I do like love the brand. Like it's like, it, it does feel like a special kind of part of you and you don't want to like let the brand down. And so, um, and like, you're also employing all these people. And I think we have like a really great culture and like, I feel like literally responsible for these people's careers. And so, um, once I was in, like, I, I'm obsessed and, and the stakes are like too high for it to fail. And so I couldn't even like think about leaving. That doesn't mean that it's not really hard. And sometimes I'm like, why did you like, think this was a good idea? Like, this is crazy, but I would never, I don't think there's like, you, I don't think you could even pay me to go back now. Um, yeah. like there's no world, but it's definitely like has a lot of ups and downs, like high highs and low lows. Oh yeah. That's, that's standard. Um, and so as you said, so COVID, you guys skyrocketed, which I think this is something that most people missed is like the, with COVID, everyone stopped traveling and going out and had a, but had a lot of extra money. Like, let's just be real. The government paid everyone to keep, paid companies to keep their employees and then paid those individuals more money too. So there's a lot of disposable income. And as you said, a lot of the big companies pulled out of advertising, which dropped the cost to advertise. So if you're in direct to consumer in 2020, you pro if, if you did the right things, you did really well. And coming out of that, how and now we're in this aftermath of COVID, people are talking about the supply chain. Have you guys been okay figuring out that? As you said, even early, you were struggling with keeping up on inventory. Do you want to take it or you want me to? Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, we definitely still have some supply chain issues, uh, especially I think ours is like a like kind of a combo of issues because we are self-funded. And so we have to be very conservative with like the orders that we're placing because we yeah. don't have like the flexibility to sit on a ton of inventory that we're not moving through. And mm -hmm. so I think the combination of conservative ordering and like de the delay of a lot of like the shipments and even getting like stuck at the port, we had our number one SKU during COVID, like which was really great for us, but we had our number one SKU at the time was stuck in the port for three months. We were out of stock for 
for three months and it was here, it was just stuck. Um, so we definitely have a ton of those issues. We, um, even still like we've gotten a lot better, but, uh, we recently launched a new, like a totally new construction of like a half up, half down ponytail and it sold out within 24 hours. We restocked it four times since every time it sold out within either 24 hours or like three days. And so that's like a huge issue that, that we've just been working through because it's also currently like our number one, like performing like ad set. And so I think that especially being self-funded, that'll probably always be something that we really toe the line on. Which is smart. I mean, it forces you to be a little more responsible too. That's, that's a scary thing about raising money. That makes sense. So two more questions for you both. Number one, what's next? What do you, what's, what's in the future? What do you want to be next? I'll start with Sharon on this one. I think what's next for us is we really want to become like the one-stop shop for all things hair. Um, We actually launched an Ulta in September and it's been so amazing. Like the, the response has been incredible. Um, And we really want to own everything hair related. So hair care, you can expect a lot of that next year. Um, More hot tools, hair pieces and innovating more in the hair piece um, category as well too, because it's such a, untapped category. I think a lot of people are um, very wary of like entering it and don't know how to approach it just because sourcing it is so it's it's a very, very difficult product to source. Um, so just continue to innovate and be leaders in that in that space is something that I'm looking forward to. Anything to add, Jordan? I don't think really like a lot of people always say like, oh, what's next after INH? And I'm like, I don't, I can't even see that far because INH is like the be all end all right now. And I think that we still have so much work to do on like really every aspect. Like I really feel like we're just getting started. So. Got it. And so last question, I'll start with Jordan on this one. What's one piece of advice you either wish you got or you did get that you would, if there was someone trying to achieve their dreams or really go after it, that's just getting going, whatever age, kind of like your mom going for law school afterwards, but it could be any age, but like, what's that one piece of advice again, that you either wish you heard, or you did hear that really helped you go on your way to be a world leader. Um, <laughs> world leader. Um, I think the one, the biggest one for me when starting INH was done is better than perfect. And that was actually from that like Sheryl Sandberg book. And that like I think it's like a big Facebook motto. And that actually made a really big difference for me because when I first started, I was like responsible for building out like a lot of the marketing funnels and I like had done it previously. So I had all these ideas of like exactly how it should be. And, and we had like a very, very small team. It was basically like us and one graphic designer. So getting everything to like the level that I imagined in my head was very slow. And Sharon at one point was like, just like, get it done. And I was like, okay, you're right. So like, that is definitely, I think like, and that applies very much like the startup phase because it's never going to be perfect. Like it's better to just like launch with something that at least like gets the job done. So that was a really big unlock for me. Got it. And how about you, Sharon? What would be that one advice, one note? Um, I think for me is it's kind of cheesy, but like your world is your oyster. Like there's so much that you could do if you put your mind to it. And this is, this is Kevin, a Kevin thing, actually. He's always like, it's a mindset. It's a mindset. Um, (laughs) Whatever you put your mind to, you can do it. You just manifest it. And I totally do believe that because I think like when you're positive, like the energy that you release attracts good energy back. And I feel like a lot of times if you go into something with such a negative mindset, you're just never going to get what you want. So just having a positive mindset and just really thinking like you could get anything you really want. Yeah. And it's kind of like a muscle. The more you force that positive mindset early on, the more it just happens naturally. So totally agree. Well, Jordan, Sharon, this has been awesome. Thank you for coming on Hawk Talk. Thanks so much for having us. You've been listening to the Hawk Media Podcast. To ensure that you never miss an episode, make sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.